Okay, welcome everybody to oh, yeah. our new Earth Community, um, Earth University podcast series. We were going to call it Community Connections because that's the name of the stage that we're having on, at the festival. And then I was thinking maybe we should just call it Gather and Create podcast. I don't know. We'll we'll be uh, settling on a name. And but the main thing is we're going to be chatting with lots of the folks that will be coming to the Gather and Create Festival. We'll probably hopefully do a couple more before the uh, festival, and then we'll definitely do one once a month um, for the next year until the next festival and, and let some folks get to know some of these experts and tiny house people. Um, I love tiny house people. They're super fun and outside the box thinkers. So we love to to gather and create with other tiny house folks. So today, well, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Christina and, and I'm Peter. We're the owners of Indigo River Tiny Homes. So we've been building tiny homes since 2017. We actually built our first tiny home in 2009 with our previous construction company. Yeah, so we've, so. we've been building, that was on foundation and um, we've been building Mostly Peter's been building and I've been supporting um, since 2005 and lots of home improvement jobs, house flipping, you know, doing what we got to do. The first couple of years of tiny house building, we uh, did some remodeling and flipping and, you know, stuff like that to get it going. And now we're pretty much just building tiny houses and yep. now we're putting on a tiny house festival. Yeah. The baton has been passed to us, so yeah. And so Lindsay is with us. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Lindsay Wood, the Tiny Home Lady. I'm super excited we're here doing this because you and I have been talking about it for about a month, and it's been a big vision of mine to just you know collaborate. Right? That's what we're we're all about. We can't really do this by ourselves, uh, which is often the case when I work with my clients and my Go Tiny Academy students. And people like yourself, when I found out you guys were launching an event, I know how much that takes. I've been involved in festivals and events for a long time. So it was more like, okay, let's get out the word. How can we get out the word to my community, to your community, um, and share what each of us does? Because, you know, you build beautiful homes. I know because I've seen them in areas in Colorado. I can't wait to see you in your, your home turf in Texas very soon. Um, and, and so then what are the things that you might be looking at that you face all the time and every day and questions that you get that you don't necessarily solve? So there's where we come into play. Um, a lot of times it's about the three big things, the land, the build of the home and the finance. The good news is you cover two of the three really well, right? You get the build and you get the finance, but that first one is a doozy and it's already been brought up early before we hit the record. What about where to place it? And for very few companies that I know out there help people, actually I know of no builder that helps people find the land. <laughs> Some help with permitting, very few percent help with permitting. And then more or less, a lot of it's just sort of left to the person to figure it out. And that's a lot to figure out. Yeah. What well, about all we have is a really long FAQs where you can read through and, and you know, who give advice about, you know, where to look and what it, what it's like in Texas. And, um, you know, realtors are your friend because they can help you read the the zoning and figure out, you know, if there's a piece of property you're looking at, bite the bullet and hire a realtor and get them to help you make sure that you can, you know, put your tiny home, whatever the category is. And then, of course, and some realtors that are new may not know about land, like raw land zoning and stuff. That's a little bit more challenging, like the easiest thing is a house that's already on land because it's already in title. There's already been all the development of water, sewer, electrical, yes. setting of the home, everything, soils test, all of it. But when you take raw land, which a lot of people, anyone here, curious where people are coming from. Because I know they sent out to a group of people and we sent out. So I know we've got California in the house. Anyone here in Texas from within the Indigo River tiny home community? Let us know in the chat so that we have a little better idea of where you're from will also very much determine what kind of opportunities you have for placing the homes. 
All right, Dallas Fort Worth. That's where Ford's at. That's great. We're going to be talking yeah. about something very exciting, right? The festival. Yeah. Of course, we want to go and chat a little bit more about the build. So we're going to talk about three things. Here from Colorado too. Yeah, Colorado. We got some updates on that. Um, we're going to have a lot more probably within the month of June. And I can tell a little bit more about at least why that is. Yeah. Oh, another one, Jennifer, Dallas-Fort Worth. Cool. Anyone else? We got a few more people on the list. All right, Mendocino, Mendocino. Kevin Ander. Yay, Kevin. That's my home turf. Mm -hmm. Northern California. Good. So we got a good representation. Colorado, Texas, and California. Yeah. Those are probably the places I know the most about the parking situation. <laughs> <laughs> Although Florida is pretty friendly just because RVs are allowed a lot of places in Florida. So, um, and I'm currently sitting in Arizona right now, launching a big tiny home village. And I, I see Gustavo, Southern California, San Bernardino and Riverside. This is great. Um, so the, the things we're talking about today are really covering. Um, one of the things that I love to do is really find out what's going on with builders because Peter and Christina, you've been busy and you've got some latest and greatest stuff that's going on inside your factory and the work that you've been doing, especially around this new acronym. I'm going to let you debut it because it's pretty cool. Not everyone knows about it. Do you want to start? Is no, this? Oh. So, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that is little known is that it's not a new acronym. SIPs have been built since the sixties. And so they build, um, apartment buildings with it they build uh it's especially hurricane proof so a lot of like cottages and and uh, beach houses are built out of them and they stand up to hurricanes really well um but it's a building process where you use it's called structural insulated panels yes that, that's so what I'll let peter take over for. and basically it's two um cheap panel products with uh, a structural foam in between and they can be there's a few different types of foam most of them are made with um eps which stands for extended expanded polystyrene which is like a high density styrofoam and then um you can also use uh there's some polyurethane type uh foams that are used as well and th those tend to be a little bit more expensive um and a little bit heavier as well but they they also have a higher r value so a lot of people prefer those um, but the, the structural insulated panel when you, has fewer two by fours in it. So it helps reduce the weight of your tiny house. Um, especially if you can use, um, a finished panel on the inside, like a, a birch plywood on the inside, um, or, or something to that effect and or, uh, siding on the exterior and, and sandwich those. So that that'll help reduce the weight, reduce the amount of wood in the house because you have to really eliminate that layer of OSB um, on the inside and outside. So it looks like an ice cream sandwich. And Peter went to find our sample, but find he it. couldn't find it. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's two structural boards with the foam in between. And then you just run the wire chases. And yeah, that is, that is one of the things. So, you know, every building, every, every building process has um, its pot is pluses and minuses. Uh, the, the structural insulated panels, the, the, one of the biggest drawbacks is that you have to pre-plan your wiring very well because um, you have to pre-cut all your wire chases. And if you have any plumbing that's going to be run inside the wall, all that has to be um, pre-cut and sometimes pre-wired or, or pre-run um, for the water lines uh, before the before the panel is is pre compressed. Um, because it's, you can do it after the fact, but it's, it's just a little bit more difficult, um, especially if you have a long wire run. You, we can do short runs like we have a outlet that we need to go up, up above a countertop and we need one down below you know we can just drill down or vice versa drill up uh, but to make a long run it's more difficult so that's that's really probably the biggest drawback to sips uh, they are more expensive to do but they're structurally they're one of the best um, building structures are around uh, in my opinion especially for tiny houses and you know we've we've used all different types we've used fiberglass sips which are super light but they're pretty hard to come by 
Um, so that'd be what like a boat is made out of. Right. Yeah. So it's got a fiberglass skin on the inside and outside and also a little bit harder to, to finish out because you have to use some special um, uh, fasteners and, and glues and things to even just attach something to the wall. Uh, the And then a lot of so, some builders are using uh, steel structural insulated panels, and those are really lightweight as well. But um, the thing I don't like about steel is it get and they're using that for the finish inside and out. But it gets dented, and so once it gets dented, you can't fix That's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and then, um, so we use wood sips for what we do. Um, we've also built with steel framing, uh, which you know, comparably, their steel is pretty comparable in in weight savings and uh, structural strength. Um, the I think the R value is a little bit better in sips, uh, and the thing, the reason we prefer the wood sips is because it's uh, it's got the, um, it's easier to attach things to basically you can nail into it. Whereas with steel, you got to screw everything unless you buy a really high end, uh, steel, uh, nail gun, uh, which are pretty hard to come by actually. And, and, um, and kind of expensive product, especially if you're just doing one off, if you're doing a lot of them, then you know, it's, I'm sure it's worth <laughs> the nail gun to, versus screwing every, every board into the, into the steel framing. So that's, that's the reason why we prefer uh, wood sips over, over the steel framing, but the. Um, and the seal is just better. There's less air infiltration. Yeah. There are fewer cracks, you know, so the, it's a, it's a good R value, but it's also not drafty at all. It's they're They make walk-in coolers out of these things. So you're, you know, air exchange is really important when you, when you yeah. build with sips. So so have we told all the benefits of SIPs? I think so. Yeah, the, the structural and the insulation value, because it does have a higher R value as well, um, because you got the inside and outside panel in the in your envelope of your house is sealed up um, tighter than traditional two by four framing. Uh, two by four framing we've we've used on um, probably half of the houses that we've built. And you know, that's that that way is a little bit um it costs less to do two by four framing. It's easier to do the electrical and the plumbing because you've just got the open two by fours. You just drill holes wherever you need to go and, and run it and then come in and, and spray foam it afterwards. Um, and so the, the spray foam works really well to seal everything up too. Um, so that, but structurally the, the SIPS is, is, I think it's about four times stronger is what I, if I remember correctly than traditional two by four framing. Yeah. So yeah, once you build the SIPS panels, um, the the shell can be assembled really fast. Yeah. Um, so one of the drawbacks of SIPS that we've experienced is just that um, sourcing SIPS and finding vendors oh, yeah. that could build the SIPS has been difficult. There was a SIPS manufacturer that was in business for like 20 something years in 50 Fort years. Worth. Oh, 50 years. In Fort Worth, and then they went out of business when we, you know, once we started <laughs> buying sips from them. So we've we've had some um, good sips manufacturers, but and then another one came along, and they they were only in business for about two years, and we we actually had some houses on order with them, and and so we ended up hiring their um, shop manager to come over, and and so we're and set up a set up a system in our sh in our own shop, and so. We're actually uh, manufacturing our own SIPs now. So. so that's our big news. And and the plus side of that is that we can, we're, we think we're going to be able to get the price to be a little closer to what the two by four framing is going to be since we're not having to, you know, basically Absolutely. have profit, you know, give profits to another company, <laughs> um, you know, for the SIPs that they want to sell us. We're, we're building those in house um, and, you know, trying to get the price down so that it's, more in reach and you know when we build tiny homes that we're gonna you know maybe put on airbnb or um my daughter is 13 she's ready for her tiny house to be built you know we'll build them with sips because it's just the best um you know strongest lightest weight it's got all the all the great benefits so um I guess you said everything yeah. about, and so, and then the other piece of news at Indigo River is we have an opening for an apprentice. So we, we have um, pretty much everybody that's working with us has started as an, currently working with us has started as, as an apprentice. And 
Um, some folks just stay for six to nine months and then they move on with the skills that they've learned here. And then, you know, some stay and, and uh, become house leaders and, you know, team leaders. So we're, we're building our team and we're teaching folks how to build tiny homes, two by four framing, SIPs, uh, panels and metal framing, you know, you get exposed to all the things because <laughs> yeah. we're a custom builder. So we build whatever the customer orders and do the best we can to build the a house that's going to last. You also yeah. offer models out of curiosity because I know you've built a lot of customs. Do you ever turn those into models that people can then buy? Yeah, we have, we, you know, we have some standard models um, and, you know, our, one of our signature designs is the stand-up loft with, with the wraparound landing. So you can stand up on two sides of your bed. Um, actually, you have something similar like that behind you uh, there. The, uh, but we have, and a lot of builders do that in the goosenecks, but we, we do it on bumper pools as well. So you have a stand-up bedroom instead of a crawling loft. Um and so that's that's our signature design, and and so we have that. We have uh, our Rambler model has one stand up bed, stand up loft, and um, and that's it. And then our Homesteader has a stand up loft and a crawl up crawling loft. Entertainer has two stand up lofts. Our Pioneer has a downstairs bedroom. So we have we do have some. We most of our um, customers we start off with our one of our one of those layouts, and then just. It, just tweak it to whatever um, they want. And sometimes it gets way away from what, what originally started, <laughs> what our, what our original plans are, but or layout is. And then um, sometimes it's, you know, they, they don't change much except for the finishes. So it's, you know, we, it's, but that's the fun part of it is, is trying to figure out, um, you know, for the customer, what they want and how they want it. So how they want to live and then we find the solutions for you yeah. know, how to arrange it so they can have almost all the things you know they, yeah. there are some compromises but generally not too many we can usually yeah. accommodate most for most of the requests we get yeah sometimes we're like you got to remind people it's a tiny house you can't fit everything <laughs> in it, but we, we fit most of everything but so. i think that's why we're building huge ones lately because everybody you know is if they're going to pay a builder to build it they just go ahead and get you know max it out the 399 square feet <laughs> yeah since i have sharing ability one of the best tricks i always say inside my academy is try before you buy right because a lot of people if you've never lived tiny and it is funny to hear the word huge our home is 32 feet long eight and a half wide we had plenty of comments throughout the years of showing it like, that's a really big tiny home. I'm like, okay, let's get this straight. <laughs> Homes on average are 2,500 square feet. Yeah. So if you take the average square foot, I think I figured out was like 12, we're 12% 12 of the footprint yeah. of the average, even at a big size of 400. Of course, a lot of people max out at the 400 when you're using the park model standard, which is some of the easiest places to build. Yeah. Uh, going in different directions and other standards, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I do want to highlight what you guys have on your website, which a lot of people don't know about. Rent it, try it before you buy, get yourself inside a tiny home. And the coolest thing about Indigo River is they have one. What do you call it? The Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Sorry. Indiegogo. So that one's designed to be easy to, to travel with. It's shorter. Then generally we build 13 and a half feet tall, but that's one that's shorter. I love it. And you've got, so you can click here and I'm in, oh wait, coming soon. So this one, book your stay. And there we go. And it's right on the lake. Mm. Oh my mm. goodness. That looks adorable. Wait, is this the one that was in Colorado? Yes. Oh my gosh. The one with the most adorable. Okay. I freaked out when so I it's this. for sale still. We're, we're, you know, we put it on Airbnb while we're looking for the perfect we've learned that there's a perfect owner for every tiny home but we just have to find them <laughs> Take some where time. in colorado <laughs> the, oh, oh we was at the in, tiny house show last last year in colorado, yeah. in colorado. no I, you said this one is in colorado right now no, no it's no, in no. texas right now we brought it to the people's fest and to the colorado tiny house festival last summer yeah, it's it's in it's in about an hour and a half south of Dallas right now, by uh, Richland Chambers Lake. This was yeah. featured at the Colorado show. That's why I remember it. The reason why I'm going to highlight right here. I was amazed. 
toaster, coffee maker, a little tiny griddle thing. Mm. And then I, I forgot what that was. It was like a four in one appliance. Yeah, it's <laughs> the cutest little thing. It was perfect because we just did a kitchenette in this one since it was going to be Airbnb. It's all one level. That's that's really common. We get a lot of requests for all one level tiny homes. So that's our Pioneer model and Pioneer or Indiegogo if you want it to be shorter. I love it. So you can take your bath, you know, a little relaxing getaway and then yeah. have your beautiful views because look at that big picture window looking right on the lake. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah it's got a full size soaking tub, which was one of Christina's requirements. When he started building tiny houses, I said, you better put a soaking tub in there because old ladies like me are not going <laughs> to. And and I'm with you. probably about half of our customers want the soaking tub about, you know, the other half just want a shower stall. But it's people really feel strongly about this issue. People will say, why did you waste all that space with that soaking tub? And some people will say, I can't live without a soaking tub. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do it all. <laughs> it's their own and so where is this place this is kind of a cool thing because those other angles of the images look like it was the only one in the middle of a giant field yeah so it's called peninsula point it's an rv and tiny home community um resort they call it you know so it's um out there's only a couple people that live there full time but um right next door we built that that house that's the luan some folks have seen that um yeah and it's also available on airbnb yeah, and that's on our link too. So so okay. we only own a couple of those homes on the link and then some of our customers. Um, that's so that's yeah. the Luan, that's next door okay. to the Indiegogo. And then there's, um, you know, folks always ask about the legality of the homes, but let me tell y'all, the tiny house movement started as basically a big F you to the government. Like we're, they said, we can't live in houses under 400 square feet. And People said, oh, yeah, watch us. And so they started building, you know, and living in not HUD approved <laughs> homes and then also parking them where they want to park them. And so most people like one of these on Airbnb is um, in a suburb of Dallas that is parked illegally in the backyard. But, you know, it's. um it depends on your location. You can, a lot of people fly under the radar in the tiny home community and park in people's backyards and, you know, random places that might not necessarily be legal, but, you know, there's ways to, to figure it out. Now this last house here, um, Bertha, that one is in Colorado. That one's in Florissant. Um, and uh, if you go to our website to there. It was close to the fires that they just had. And oh, we yeah. were, we had a prayer vigil there for a minute. <laughs> so that Bertha didn't burn down and it it uh, survived. <laughs> oh. But you can contact these people. They don't have it listed on Airbnb. Yeah, they, just contact them directly. Yeah, they they only want to rent to people who are interested in tiny houses, so they're um they use it mostly for their personal use, but they will they will rent it out. I'll put that so in the Being chat. a tiny house person has benefits and perks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to go back to the whole like legal and under the radar thing right because yeah. it's a thing um and i like to always tell the story of jay schaefer one of the godfathers the godfather of tiny homes and he happened to live in iowa in the winter he actually lived in a number i, I learned this very small airstream so jay was already predisposed to small if jay was predisposed to like i have a giant fifth wheel we probably would have seen bigger tiny homes from the very beginning <laughs> Look at Jay's original thing. I actually have the book right downstairs. Um, you see his little tiny, tiny airstream. We're talking little capsule. So no surprise, he was dealing with like a lot of insulation challenges, freezing pipes, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, you can have freezing pipes if you don't do the plumbing right. Right, Peter? Yeah. <laughs> so you got to do the plumbing right. But besides that, you just have a thin wall. That's what's happening with an RV straight up. And that was when he kind of really thought, you know, it'd be great to live in something like this, but not have to, I think he's had all these defrosting situations and having to constantly keep the heat on. And so that's when he had the bright idea of like, okay, I like it on wheels because I don't own this land below me, but I wanted to behave more like a regular home where I've got a two by four insulation. I've got insulation, you know, a real wall and all the other features. And then the loft of above because he still kept it in like a 20 foot max that yeah. was jay's world nice, of course yeah. 
more of us starting getting a hold of like, well, that looks great, but I need it bigger. I have two dogs. I got a husband. I've got, you know, I have her in this office. I would normally close this door so my husband doesn't have to hear, but we just moved. There's the moving box. <laughs> there we go. I was hiding that, but now I'm not hiding it. I'll just come out and be uh, so real. You're so, you're a real person. <laughs> real person, in real tiny home, husband down there, and I really needed a door to close. You know, we've also just moved here with our tiny home here in Arizona uh, at the Whistle Stop AZ, AZ Whistle Stop RV Park. And it's a new park here in Arizona that's open to tiny homes as well. And I'm connected with United Tiny Homes, but we're like, please bring your tiny home as long as they're certified, right? Got to make sure it's certified. And oh, by the way, who are you certified by? What is Indigo River? RBIA and NOAA. There you go. Certification is so important for making sure your buildings are built safely, on um, being able to park legally, kind of getting back around to that conversation. And then more and more insurance providers are requiring it. Finance companies are requiring it. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of parks are required. Yeah, don't certify. yeah a, lot of parks won't let, a lot of uh, RV parks and tiny house villages won't let you in unless you have a certification. So even if you're doing a DIY, um, you can still get NOAA certified and um, and that will that will allow you to get into to more places and get better insurance. And I just want to do a plug for NOAA because without them, we wouldn't have survived our first couple of years in business. You know, all of the houses we built in the beginning were NOAA certified. We had six houses in the Lake Dallas Tiny House Village when it originally opened, you know, six of the 13. And we stayed in business the, those first couple of years because we could build to the NOAA certification. And then NOAA does this great thing where they do a video inspection of the build. So your home gets video inspected. The videos are on file with the NOAA on their NOAA servers. And so if you sell the home, you can show, you know, the buyer can look at the videos and see inside the walls and make sure that it was built, you know, so it really helps with resale value. Um, NOAA's, NOAA's a great organization, a good advocate for tiny living and helping, helping us get tiny, more tiny homes legal. Yeah in more places. And, you know, let me just say in terms of parking, you know, in DFW, somebody just asked, you know, um, in Texas, we're lucky that if you're outside the city limits, generally you can do what you want. Um, there's some exceptions to that, but um, with within the city limits, it's a little bit harder or you just fly under the radar. Um, but since we started building tiny homes on wheels, I mean, there were like five places to park around DFW. And now there's like 35 places to park that, you know, a lot of RV parks are allowing tiny homes now. You just have to ask. Sometimes they say no, but, you know, doesn't hurt to ask. There's and that's a good place to just park until you find your forever place. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. That's a big one for so many people I find. This has been an ongoing thing with my clients. So I'll hear I need to find the land. I need to find the home. I don't, that's like, it's so much, right? Just doing the financing and figuring out what your budget is and then getting the home built. And then, you know, the good news is while it's being built, if you really are looking for land and you're only going to do it that way, then that's a great time. If you're looking for land and you want to have a certain, you know, building standard that is built to, that's it adds more layers of it. So if you just know, like, I really want to just get a tiny home, I'm open because I can live I can work from home. That's a lot of people that are more flexible to live wherever. Then yeah, the RV parks are a great place to start. We've pretty much only lived in either under the radar places or in our RV parks like we are right now. Yeah. 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 And if you're moving around a lot, I mean, it's an easy, like army bases a lot of times have RV parks where they, you know, so like there's, there's a lot of options for places to put tiny homes. Now it might not be right inside the city that you want to be in, but that's coming that I know that is coming because it's already in Austin. It's already in so many towns in California, you know, it's happening. And one thing I can share, especially around California. So what it's really, you know, I know um, uh, we've got uh, Kathy here and Gwen from who else are here from my Go Tiny Academy? I don't, sometimes I know people by name and sometimes they are in the actual academy, but we're, what we're finding in California is they already have the accessory dwelling unit ordinance statewide. That's the same as in Oregon and Washington. 
So what we've been able to do city by city, county by county, that's jurisdiction. You know, you could be living in one area and you think you're in like the city, but you're actually in the county of San Diego. And that's happened before. Like someone was thought they were like across the street and in the in the county and they were actually in the city of Vista, which is, you know, you really have to know your accessor parcel number will determine where you are, unless you already know that. In areas like California, because the ADE law, we've been able to easier, easily, not everywhere easy, um, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Luis Obispo, many counties, there's actually 16 in total, Mendocino County um, soon to come as well. Santa Cruz just passed a big ordinance where you can not only have it in the backyard, but as a primary residence. That's happening in Placer County, Santa Cruz County, and also soon in Mendocino. Nice. Even though you're in more rural areas, California is not known for a lot of unrestricted land like it is in Texas, right? City or county, you are most likely going to be zoned. And that zoning is everything to do with the land, what's allowed on the land or not allowed. And then there's the building standard of how the home is built too. And yeah. you guys build to mostly ANSI, American National Standards Institute. Yeah, ANSI yeah. A119.5 okay. yep. plus Appendix Q. Got it. Not so much NFPA. Uh, no, because that that's typically for um, that's for travel trailers. Yep. And and you know the that I mean the NFPA does does cover the electrical code. So you know we do have to adhere to those standards, but they're not the governing body for I guess it would be the I'm not sure what the right, right term is, but the overseers of the the building code for. Um, because mostly what we're doing now is park models, as park model size tiny homes. We will do them, uh, still do them eight and a half feet wide, but really long. Like the last house we just sent out last week was eight and a half by forty four, and so it, if it's if it's uh, eight and a half feet wide and but over three hundred twenty square feet or three hundred twenty square feet or more, it can still be classified as a park model, and so um, that's that's what we're doing with the eight and a half feet wide. We're just building them really long. <laughs> <laughs> is that on a gooseneck? Because I know you it was a gooseneck. Like, yeah, got it. There you go. I heard you can go longer on a gooseneck or bigger, four hundred and thirty square feet around. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And, yeah, because the lower deck was thirty six foot plus an eight foot over the gooseneck, and that house was delivered out to um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, or about a half an hour south of Albuquerque. That's so, great. Yeah, to an RV. Yeah, park. That's a big drive. Yeah, with a big home, but. Yeah. To anyone, you you look around at some of these big semis that are 50 and 60 feet. That's not a big home to them. Yeah, I have a great picture of one of our big tiny houses between two semis at a truck stop. And it just dwarf, they dwarf oh. the, you know, even though it's it's a big tiny home. Yeah, you, you know? look at the house by itself, it looks huge. And then <laughs> you see it pull, pull up in between right. two semis. Not so big. So tell us more. I'm super excited because um, I think what I'd like to share a little bit more about with regards to that building standard and zoning laws as we reference what we're gonna do in terms of tours at the cool festival. So let's chat about this awesome festival that yeah. you two, give us a little backstory because I know this is being recorded. It's like history in the making, you know, imagine 10 years from now when it's like, oh yeah, are you going to gather and create? Well, <laughs> sure, but yeah. give us the backstory. So we've been attending, you know, all the tiny house festivals since 2017 that we could well, possibly go to you know <laughs> so so in Dallas or Austin and then we've gone to some in in Colorado and um you know we've planned planned events before in the in previous lives for homeschoolers and that kind of stuff but um we were glad to just be attendees at the event and glad for people to put on the events and let us just bring a tiny house because that's not a small thing <laughs> to bring a tiny house to a show um, so, you know, we've been, we've been attending the festivals, you know, seeing the crowd, learning kind of, you know, what the demographic is and, you know, that shows up, which it generally, people ask that a lot. It's any, it's all the gamut from DIYers to folks that are looking for a professional builder to lots of investors that are looking to buy either like a multi-unit order of tiny homes and develop land, you know, so it's, everybody comes to these shows and, um, so what happens a lot of times is the baton gets passed <laughs> with organi organizers because, it, you know, it's not a small task. And, um, so we're, we picked up the baton this, 
the spring since um, the last organizer uh, decided not to do the April show that they normally did. So we kind of last minute decided to please. call in the tribe. Hey. Hey. Uh, so we've been so super overwhelmed with, you know, the, the response from builders and, you know, folks in the industry and land developers and everybody has been contacting us wanting to, you know, be a part of the show. So um, we're a little behind on posting, you know, everybody, if you're listening, send me your logos so I can post your, your stuff on the website, but, um, we'll get caught up on that, but we've got, I just counted this morning and we've got 22 tiny structures that, um, so I want to say we probably have about 25 that are, you know, a lot of those are committed. A few of those might not show up, but I'm I'm thinking 22 might be the magic number. We've got wow. 22 50 amp hookups at the venue, so um, we won't use all those with our 22 structures that we have because some of those are schoolies and self-contained with with solar and stuff like that. So, so if you have a tiny house you want to bring, there's still time to um, you know click the link on our website, and Rosalie will get back to you with all the details. So yeah, I love it. We do have more twenty amp plugs. Eventually. Oh yeah, we have unlimited almost twenty amp plugs. It's a, it's like the perfect venue for a tiny house festival because it's super flat. There's these huge pavilions so that you know we have like vendors can be inside in the pavilion. We've got um, two open air pavilions like that is bigger. That one is bigger than a basketball court. That's where our speaker stage is going to be. And then there's one on the other end that like is going to have our music stage. Um, so one piece of news is we just, we've got live music, but we just booked our, um, our afternoons on the music stage are going to be dance lessons. So we're going to have a beginner swing dance lesson, a beginner blues dance lesson, and then dancing um, from three to five. So it's going to be, yeah. you know, not just tiny homes, but, you know, one of the things we like about tiny home people is how creative everybody is. And so, you know, we wanted to bring the arts into the festival and have more DIYers, have more, um, you know, vendors that have that are artisan quality, you know, um, items and then also, you know, the performing arts. So and the swing dance lessons are free, by the way. Oh, yeah. I think we'll <laughs> include it in your in your admission. Yeah, I love it. And this South Fork Ranch, anyone a Dallas fan from, <laughs> I'm not talking Way about the football team. So this was surprising to me because I I was a child when, you know, Dallas came out and I guess a teenager by the time it was, <laughs> the show was over and I didn't really watch it all that much, but visiting and going on the tour was like so much fun. My 13 year old daughter loved it. She was totally, she she's it. been watching the show now since, <laughs> <laughs> since we did the tour and but it was, I was really surprised at how, I mean, it was really nostalgic. You know, the house was built in the 70s. So it's like 70s opulence, you know, um, really kind of fun, you know, and and so nostalgic. And, you know, even though I didn't watch the show a ton, um, it was it was really fun to and, and be there. And they're going to have discounted tour, um, discounted tours for people who attend the festival. Uh, I think the tour is what? Seventeen dollars, something like that. And so they're going to have like, ten dollars tours for for anybody who wants to that go. That might not be them. exactly right. Might be twelve. I don't know, but but it'll be six dollars off whatever their normal price is. I think is what she said. Oh yeah, I think it's sixteen, and because I remember. Oh $10, maybe <laughs> ten dollar ticket for the tour. Yes, the bus is belongs at South Fork. They they it's a, it. a bus that used to um I guess they used to use it, and when it. It was just on the property. And I think during COVID, they were like looking for projects to do. So they converted it. And so this is like their food truck. When they have venues, they're going to be serving barbecue out of the bus. And then that our, our bar will be there too. So mm -hmm. alcohol in the bus. And, um, and then we'll have a couple other food trucks. Well, several other food trucks, some dessert, um, a taco. And there's What's the this? original tiny home, right? Let's all get <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's what. That's what I, you know, tiny homes are the original, you know, mm -hmm. you know, 
nomadic and, and, you know, folks that lived in, you know, straw huts and, you know, there's no that. soaking tub in there though. <laughs> oh, you got to go down to the water and hole. The river, yes. And you, hope, <laughs> you hope you happen on a hot spring. Yeah. Right. I, love right. This. I think it's great. I was the one mm. where growing up, I would be like, mom, please let me stay up and watch Dallas. Like, I was that young kid in like, you know, grade school, you know, and my mom would let me watch Dallas. That was like the big soap opera at night. So, yeah, yeah, yes, I, I think I went through a little phase of that. And then I was like, well, you know, it was kind of grown up, you know, whatever. But I did watch the Who Shot JR part of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everybody watched that and all like all mm -hmm. over the world. It's translated yeah. into like 20 languages or something. And, crazy. Yeah, and broadcast in like 70 something countries. That's uh, great. originally it was you know so that yeah when we went on the tour there was people from from other countries there yeah I, I can't remember what country but our um our office administrator she's from South Africa and on Tuesday nights when uh Dallas was on the air restaurants would lose business because people were at home watching Dallas <laughs> because they only had one tv channel and they and they broadcast Dallas on Tuesday nights there. <laughs> oh my goodness! So before we move away from the festival, I do want to give a shout out to our community partners, um, Namaste Hideaway and Decathlon Tiny Homes and Battleborn Batteries um, have have jumped in to sponsor and help us cover some of these uh, event expenses, and so. Um, we're super yeah, grateful to them. Namaste. Uh, they're going to, they'll be speaking on the stage um, about building community and their tiny home community that they built. And then uh, Jerry Terry from Decathlon will be on the builders panel with Peter and uh, a couple other builders. Um, and Battleborn is uh, a, so well, they have solar and they have batteries. They have a lot of um, products for nomadic self-contained off-grid kind of stuff yeah so they have lithium batteries battleborn in our type. solar panels and things like that and so in regular mounted solar panels as well yeah they're some of the best quality known out there for people that don't know about batteries they definitely have a good reputation that's always important when that's one of the the it's pretty much one of the highest cost of your solar system yeah yeah definitely off -grid. yeah the batteries can get pretty pricey they've, they've actually come down uh a bit the last few years um you know you used to pay 2500 to 3000 for a you know five kilowatt hour battery um now now they're down to around you know 2000 or so uh, under 2000 so and, and that being the biggest cost of the you know for us we we put at least four five kilowatt hour batteries in a in a tiny house um and you know so that's a, that's a you know, even at two thousand dollars a piece, you know that's eight thousand dollars just in batteries. <laughs> so, so is now a good time to share what's right below the venue? Yes, can... that's kind yes. of our okay. next sponsor. <laughs> Go tiny! Hey. I'm so excited supporting the Tiny you. House Festival so much. So y'all, y'all check out Lindsay's stuff on her website. We're so excited yeah. that you're going to be joining us. Yeah, yeah sure I'm super excited. When I heard about the event, I'm like, okay, I've done this now five times. It started in, I have a picture of like the very first one in Pomona with the uh, Great American Tiny House Show out there in, in LA. And we were going to have this other big idea and this big training. You know, it's funny how like you think one way and then the other thing shows up like well, yeah. <laughs> for an hour, like the big training all day idea was not cool, but one not so great idea leads to a really good idea. And the Go Tiny VIP Tours is a way for people that want to not only just come to an event, but they want to get guided information and like get more of their questions answered, right? Specifics to them, specific, especially about the land, the building, and also the financing. But I really focus in on understanding about the building standards and the zoning laws we can't really solve everything just in that hour, but at least getting some wheels turning in directions that most people I hear, like I didn't even think about that. They didn't see it on a YouTube channel. They weren't able to, to really understand, you know, how to kind of piece together what they're looking at at a show.
because where you're going to place your home will determine your builder. What kind of financing you need will also determine your builder. I mean, yeah. those are all things that are super important, but you know, when you're just there as an attendee, how do you really know who are you connecting with? Um, you know, usually the builders are really busy. They're doing tours of their homes, right? They don't only have an hour to stay and, and answer your questions. There's a line out the door, literally. Yeah. <laughs> so at, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., and this is the coolest thing, no lines because it's before the show opens. And these are always the, the first ones to go, right, in terms of ticket purchasing. So it's personalized tiny home questions, no lines, and then the pre-show with me. So we're going to go around. Usually the builders will arrive a good half hour, maybe 45 minutes. Um, but oftentimes the first 20 or so minutes that we're meeting, I'm really educating people about the building standards and the zoning laws and, and things to think about for your own project. Um, certifications, I point that out all the time, every event. Okay, so then we also have, um, let's see, oh, schedule. Sorry, I'm looking at that one. I know that when you do sign up for a VIP tour, you will also be joining the VIP happy hour. But we do the tours also at noon and three. Now, clearly, there's going to be lines at noon and three. Some of the tiny homes, I'll stand in line with my tour so that we're answering questions and using and leveraging that time in line. We also can do a lot of stuff outside the homes. And then I let people go inside the homes to take a look at design. I'm, you know, as far as design is concerned, there's like a bazillion and one things we could talk about. But what I really want to make sure people understand is like, how they're going to make their home happen. And it always comes down to the land, the, you know, and the building standards and the zoning laws and how that connects. In addition to the zoning laws and all that stuff, it's also your septic, your sewer, your water. Are you going to do a compost toilet? I mean, those are constantly the things that Peter and Christina get questions asked about. And usually if you're trying to do a compost toilet and that area may or may not allow it, you need to find out if that's approved. Yeah. If you want right. to go the way you want to go, and it's not approved, then that might be more of an under the radar scenario. You know, we're not here. We're not the police. We're here to share with you just some things to be aware of, because we've also all heard stories about people buying something and then it not working out. And that's not something that's the most ideal. Have you guys ever had that where a client bought a home and then it didn't work out because of the land thing? Um, no, they'll just park in a temporary place, like an RV park until they get their land situation. Um, you know, we've only had one, one customer that kind of had a change of heart, you know, after we had bought, bought their trailer. But other than that, you know, people have lived They're in their homes ones. or, you know, sometimes it's a cabin for a hunting cabin or something like that. But um, so let me share with you a couple of pictures of what this VIP tour. First, I'll start with a video. Let me expand my screen here for a second. Okay. All right, so there we are. There's the Dallas South Fork checking out tiny homes. All aboard. We don't I don't know if here. I am with the Go Tiny Academy and guiding people on going tiny. We thought we would do these VIP tours because, you know, the tiny homes are here, the people are here. And I have been building the network. Hi, it's Lindsay the Good Friday Lady. I have so enjoyed connecting with Stephanie on her VIP tour. Entrance in, like the doors are closed. You were out there and you walked right in. And what I've learned is it's what is it? It's not what you know, do you know? In our case, it's what you know and who you know. <laughs> the the chair. Spend time in person. Very smart. Okay. Because I didn't know anything and she knows everything. <laughs> Or a lot of here, a lot of things. Okay, so do it. <laughs> and I can ask you with a number of people. It's a lot network. of people. It's the it's network. Really you know. Boom. Yeah, yeah. and I've been building that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining the VIP Go Tiny Tour. All right, I'm here with Nicole and Alex. Can you just please the VIP Go Tiny Tour? How was that for you guys? That's amazing. So much information. So useful. If you need to have any questions, make sure you talk to the training All right. So, so I have to tell you, my kids said 
the endorsement from the lady that's a fan of the Step Brothers movie is like primo. <laughs> like if she said this is good, they're like, we're in. Actually, <laughs> I love little that little movie. Story, <laughs> little quick story on her. Um, I'm not going to name names because I've learned that lesson. Um, her builder did not come through for her. And we connected her to another builder that was able to go to the home while it was in mid build because it was in the nearby area and just sort of share some things that, you know, were just a bit of a concern. And this isn't even anyway, there's a whole bunch of reasons like why she was there and signed on for the tour because she really wanted to know and did, to do a double check. Yeah. Um, you know, I just heard of someone getting their deposit rerouted because someone took over someone's email account. Mm. That's just happened yet i know oh. it's someone you actually know so there's a lot of things to make sure you do right um if anyone doesn't already know my story our builder went out of business in the middle of the build so this tiny home that we're sitting in was not finished none of this was finished we got the build we had put in sixty five thousand out of the ninety thousand dollar budget that we had you know been quoted and we had about thirty thousand left i mean if you look back on shells i mean i don't know What's a shell these days for 32 foot gooseneck off the top of your head? Probably not 60,000. 80,000 80, now. This was six years ago. Back yeah. in those prices. Back then it was about 45,000. Yeah. Um, That's about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we did get solar on it. So that helped. But regardless, we had 30,000 to finish it. And most people, when I ask that question, like if that happened to you, what would you do? They're like, uh oh. I'd be in trouble. At least our family was able to finish it. There's definitely things about the home that I wish would have been different on, um, you know, that's the beauty of going with Indigo River Tiny Homes is that you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> when you work with Peter and Christina, they build we figure it out for you. Homes. Sorry. We figure it out for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. And, you know, we, unfortunately that, unfortunately that builder's no longer in business. So that's good. Here's the example of some VIP tours that just happened in San Diego. We had 96 tours, uh, let's say 120 tickets available. We sold 96 of them. Uh, obviously the early access ones were full. We had 20 people per group. Um, I was able to go through and believe it or not, they had all their clipboards. They had uh, this sort of guidebook that I took with me. Uh, we talked about the building standards and the zoning laws and all the different things. What's really cool, and it's definitely gonna happen in Texas, is that I make sure I know all the builders before you show up based on what it is you're looking for, budget, style, you name it, where it's going to go. I connect people to the builders and then I feature the builders when we're going around doing this tour. And that will definitely happen there at the gathering crate. So there we are. We were in front of Pacifica. Um, there was information about the certification that I was sharing with people, um, especially if you're going to an RV park that has yet to really understand about tiny homes and you need to do some education. So really empowerment is the name of the VIP tour there. I don't think I, I think I'm done with, there we go. And then the last thing I wanted to share is about the Go Tiny Academy. For anyone that wants to do a deeper dive, um, I've got here on with me, Kathy, and I know Gwen's here. I'm gonna stop my share there. Um, any, if you guys wanna unmute yourself, don't mean to put you on the spot, but you've been, in it, you you guys know from the other side. I'm looking at Gwen there. <laughs> Hi, Gwen. So Gwen's up in Michigan, and she is working with Bernice. Her and her her buddy are teaming up, and they're looking to develop their own tiny home village as well as go tiny for themselves. So she was looking for something a little bit more than just her own home, and education that's a little bit in more in depth. Yeah. And then, so she signed up for the VIP package, which also gives access to me weekly. And we go into all kinds of topics from tires to building standards. Um, I also weave in my Go Tiny Pro show, which is like my form of my podcast once a month and uh, have a blast with that. We had Terry Landtrip, who's also going to be speaking. Here's the overlap, you guys. This is what I love about the Gather and Create. I had Terry featured in my Go Tiny Pro show. Terry is going to be speaking because he created Lake Dallas, which is a tiny home village, kind of one of the early ones. Yeah. And Christina and Peter, you guys had how many tiny homes you built for them? Six. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and yeah. now more because some of those have moved out and some of our other homes have moved in. <laughs> I think in, in all, I think we've had eight or nine houses kept, uh, there. Live there some at point. some point. Yeah. Yeah. 
and they so have the in tap, spaces. So yeah, you're going to tap into the people. The other one I want to make sure I don't forget just to jump back to this website and we click on financing. Um, I can tell you, every, I've been to so many shows. Like I went to, I go to 10 at least a year and that's been going on for five years. Well, except for COVID was like two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's really cool. Do you guys feature Sal or Sal? Oh, yeah, there 21st. Okay. There we go. So Sal is going to be at the Gather and Create event. So, you know, if you have questions specific about financing, um, he's going to be there. Questions about development. Terry's going to be there in person. It's just the party coming yes. together to support this wonderful, amazing couple that is like being the like holder of all the people to create the place to have inspiration and empowerment around housing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Sal's bringing a house. We just found out. So that's yeah. not on the website yet, but it's coming. Um, we'll, there'll be more land developers. Um, we have another bank that is talking about coming. So they're going to be a new um, option that's more for people who want to buy land for a tiny house or um, you can finance your build if it's for investment purposes kind of that it's you know so yeah, it's, they do more business financing yeah so, so but but they do you know from a hundred thousand dollars to five million dollar loan so if you want to buy several tiny houses you know there's it's going to be a great lending option I or think. develop a property for for like a tiny house community or or for rentals yeah so they're signing up i think they're signing up today and now i can't sequoia sequoia capital yeah, so they'll be on our website soon. Financing needed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, that's the huge. Specialist that can really focus in. In fact, that's a great, um, you know, Gwen and Kathy are here. You can see how how now I'll be able to like tap into that resource and bring that forward to, within the Academy. You know, the Academy was really born out of the fact that we had our Builder Go Bust. We had to learn all about our own certifications, the testing, the whole thing. And then one thing led to another I joined the Tiny Home Industry Association, which Indigo River is also a member of, a commercial member. And it's just, <laughs> it's hard to figure it all out from YouTube videos, right? And the industry is growing. We are adding on jurisdictions all the time, RV parks all the time. There's going to be new evolution. I, you know, right now I know there's a press release about it with the International Code Council and the Tiny Home Industry Association talking about making a new standard that would be think of it more like we often say inside the industry you may not have heard this like ANSI plus because if I'm not correct what does an ANSI require in terms of the R value is it an R5 Peter yeah. do you know that uh the ANSI 8119.5 I don't know off the top of my head but the NFPA for travel trailers is is like an R5 yeah yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so we build way higher than that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really thin wall. That's just yeah. one example of many aspects of the build. So if you're going to build to that, you're going to have a lot of heating and cooling, period, yeah. because you got thinner walls. Yeah. So if you think about like a lot of the builders are building to ANSI because it's the only standard that's available. Well, some of the big issues is that it's known for temporary living. That's just the standard right. and how it was built. It's just the best one that we've been able to kind of identify like, well, it's on wheels. So it's more like an RV, but it's not really an RV. And so you've just been uh -huh. in this like bouncy house where straight up tiny home industry has been like slapped around a lot by all this issues with regards to not being able to place our homes. Yet they're amazing. Yes. They're far more superior than even the ones built to HUD certification. Yes. Because HUD is national. I don't know all the HUD specs, like in terms of insulation and all that, but what yes. you can do in Tennessee, you can also do in California. In California, you can not much more like mobile home. Yeah. It's, you know, mobile homes fall apart if you move them more than once, mm -hmm. you know, and we've heard a lot of stories from like manufactured tiny homes that it starts falling apart within the first year. Just things like the drawer pulls come off, you know, it's, it's usually not high quality materials. Yeah. And that's where we get this whole trailer. Yes. Now, as much as we know these tiny homes are adorable and they're built on a trailer, the stigmatism of a living in a trailer has begun way before I was born, like around my yeah. mom, you know, she's 80. And now, you know, back in the 40s is when 
what was happening after the World War II, all the people coming back, let's go build houses fast. Right. Fast and cheap, right? That's what we did. And we're still paying for it by way of this industry, trying to find more attainable, affordable housing solutions. And ones that people just want more simple living. They don't want to clean as much. They right. don't want to have all the things that are requiring, that are required of them in living in a bigger home. Yeah, a, a huge part of our um, the, our customer base is are people that are downsizing. You know, empty nesters, uh, people getting ready for retirement. Um, you know, and they they don't want the big house anymore to take care of. They want something small and simple to you know to uh, so they can enjoy their life more, basically, and not not worry so much about their house. And they've been keeping their three bedroom, four bedroom house up in case their kids come to visit and then their kids never come visit. So they get a tiny home on wheels and they can take it to where their kids are, you know, and park outside of their kid's house in one state and then go to another state when the weather's better there and park outside another kid's house. <laughs> so, I mean, and I think all ages are downsizing. We we have families, we do three and four bedroom tiny homes. So, you know, we get a lot of inquiries from families. Um you know, folks that are going to start a family, you know, but they, and they just want to own their own home. They're tired of paying rent. Yeah. So this yeah. makes it attainable. I put in the chat, what is your number one? Everyone here, we've all been chatting for a little bit. Number one reason for going tiny. There may be many. I know mine was home, home ownership. I was tired of the rental cycle. I just needed to step off the the hamster wheel of paying someone else's American dream. Right. right. We live tiny. I don't, it's not everybody knows when I met Peter, he was living in 350 square feet. And can I tell him about the windows? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a fine place, but his decorating skills, I'll just put, I'll just say that <laughs> those, they were interesting, but you know, I was a single mom. I had a toddler and you know, I was like, do you ever have openings in your, you know, part is they were built after the war, um, but, but good quality, you know, bills, they were like quadplexes. And, and um, he said, they never have openings because, you know, it's so the deep was and cheap. yeah, the, it, was, it was, it was 350 square feet. It was plenty of space. And then he went to pay his rent and they said, oh, the apartment next to you is opening up, which, you know, never happens. So I grabbed that. So I lived tiny with my three-year-old at the time and um, it was perfect. It was, you know, just what we needed. It was what I needed to, you know, move out of where, where we were before and, and go to a place that um, we could have our own space and it had a little yard and, you know, it was great. So we've had more kids and um, we homeschool and, you know, so now we're in a bigger place, but we'll eventually end up tiny again once you know kids are gone and uh we With have favorite some model. elderly parent elderly parents that need a little tiny home that we can keep them separate in their tiny home and then we can have our tiny home over here that is such a, a popular my i did four shows in just one month of march that was the common theme of i have property either my mom my kids it was some family member that needed to go in the backyard. And I just think about in San Diego alone, they need a hundred thousand homes in the next six years. Oh, wow. Dang. Yeah. Just, you know, and so what do you do without them? Right. You, you, everyone jumps in on, on the, you know, the long lines of, of people wanting, you know, that apartment. Um, I, you know, it's amazing. Like how many of us have heard this? Oh, I'm saving up money so I can move out of my parents' house so I can go into the rental cycle. Right. Yeah. Those yeah, are the one. people I mostly like. You need a tiny home because at least all the money that you pour into this, your lifeblood, whatever. I mean, yes, you can start smaller, you can expand, you do all the things. But I just think about that rental again and again. I get it. For some people, they don't want to deal with any maintenance and all that. I appreciate, you know, I'm not here to say this is the only way to do it. However, we're here talking about tiny homes. Yeah. So I see in the chat, simplicity is one reason. Um, create truly affordable housing for single parent. Yeah, that was my thing is, you know, I just needed a place that we could be safe and we could, you know, have just enough space is all we needed. Yeah, we've built houses for single parents. We've built um, houses for um, young couples or young individuals who didn't just didn't want to rent anymore. And they, you know, but they couldn't afford 
necessarily afford or want to afford a, a, a large house. And so, you know, they could afford a tiny house. And, and so, they can take it with them when yeah. they move to Oregon and, you know, have a new job across the country. They can take their home with them. So, so there, it makes for a good starting, a good starter house. So maybe okay. we should open it up to a couple, a couple questions because some folks are having to well. jump out to go to <laughs> other meetings and yeah, stuff. Yeah, we're running a little long. But any questions from anybody? We definitely are going to put a deck in between two tiny houses. That's like our next goal is to, we're going to have a little lakefront property with um, decks in between tiny houses, screen porches. I saw this in Lake Conroe. That's down by Houston, I think. Yeah. Uh oh, Lindsay, Lindsay you're frozen. Like. Uh oh. <laughs> So anybody that has a question, uh, unmute yourself and, uh-oh. Is everybody frozen? I don't know. Everybody but us. She's the, maybe reclaim host. No, I, I'm the host. Oh, they're back. There we go. Are we, you guys are back. Okay. <laughs> oh, so are you. <laughs> we were saying, Lindsay froze and you're saying they froze. <laughs> Something in the Zoom world, cab on. Yeah. So any other questions? Oh, ICF ICF blocks. Have you heard of anyone building tiny with that? ICF blocks? Yes, in, insulated concrete form. Insulated ah. concrete form. Uh and I've not not on wheels, no. Uh, but on a foundation. Yeah. And they um, I'm also down in Austin. Um, we're down at the, a couple of weeks ago, down at the uh, Fishes and Loaves Tiny House Village. It's for, um, for homeless people. And they've, they've got some 3D printed concrete uh, tiny houses down there. And so that, that those were pretty cool looking. Uh, but the uh, ICF is usually on foundation. Yeah. Just because of the weight, it's heavy. It's too heavy. Yeah. Plus, any of that. Concrete. You know what? I did see a concrete house like 2017 on wheels, on wheels and it was a super heavy duty trailer. And it was good I, thing. I, yeah, I think it was the. It might have been the insulated concrete, but I, I don't remember offhand. It was. It was about six years ago, but. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's definitely a good option for on foundation. Maybe that's the way for Michigan to go because Michigan seems to be way behind California. Uh, like yeah. just their whole mindset on this <laughs> tiny home. I feel like we are years, years behind California. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the whole foundation thing. It's our temperature yeah. fluctuation here. You know, we just had like 80 degrees Friday, Saturday, and then sunday monday today it's been freezing and snowing and <laughs> so you know just the fluctuation oh. yeah always just that's the main concern that comes up so i'm learning new words i'm learning new verbiage to say to kind of start shifting their mindset from that image of uh, uh disheveled trailer park right you know, trailers because we have a lot of those and that's something every planning and zoning organization from every community I've been in front of already here that is their first thing that, yeah. that they bring up and yeah, that's the thing they're always stuck on yeah and, and we've got we've got a foundation that we work with um Operation Tiny House which is a local not, not, there's Operation Tiny Home which, which is, is national a national one. But there's a local one called Operation Tiny House for um, homeless veterans here, and they're building tiny houses for homeless veterans. But the city would would only approve it if they built it on foundation. Okay. And so that they were they've been trying for years to to get something through. They just got their plot of land um, in South Dallas um, last week. They got they got finally got title to it, and it's uh, 11 acres, and they're going to develop it and and make some commercial property in front. Uh, and then uh, the tiny houses out back, and they're hoping to have some businesses for the veterans, the homeless veterans, to work in and own. Um, so They'll yeah, be at the festival. Yeah, they will be at the festival. 
Awesome. Uh, and then there's okay. a question for Lindsay yeah. for any advice for people trying to change zoning in their city. This one's not my forte, but I can, I'm going to try to channel our buddy, Dan Fitzpatrick, uh, who does say he can rezone thing in his sleep because huh. he had 30 years of practice being a county administrative officer of the county of Fresno. So just like Gwen was sharing, she's got new lingo, new conversations. Like I say, the word permanent foundation system is something here in this RV park where you pull a tiny home in something that's very easy to move, hook up to a truck. But if you put these metal adjustable piers every four feet, that is something that the world of manufactured home, which is deemed full-time livable, even though we've already shared here how, you know, the quality of materials and the insulation. I mean, it's very frustrating when something like that can be like, no, no problem, totally approve. And, you know, if it moves in, in transport, you see cracks in the drywall, like it's normal. Yeah, that is a normal thing. In fact, one of my clients purchased a home that's built a park model by a company that also builds HUD. Very commonly, they'll build park model and HUD at the same time. Yeah. Right. Her home has a crack in the wall. It's just, that's just normal. I'm like, yeah. what else is cracked? In well, and they're lucky. Yes, because your your whole trailer can get racked on the transit because they're not, the trailers are not made really for traveling. It's a single use axle. Like it's. Yeah, yeah. and to go off a little bit more on this, because this will lead me back to zoning. That's another um, topic. Oh, yeah, we're talking about zoning. <laughs> okay. Zoning, clearly. Um, but even, even the people that transport those homes bring like eight to 10 tires with them because they're just like not right. the ideal. So back to zoning, land, here's the building standard. You know, we talked a lot about the ANSI, the HUD, and we'll talk a lot about that on the tour. The zoning is really going to come down to you having a conversation with those planners. What is it you want to do? I mean, Gwen and I have talked a lot about this in the academy. Bring as much visuals around what you're wanting to do, even if that means you paying for a graphic designer to go and redesign. Now, for example, Terry Landtrip, he owned the plot of land that he then developed. But to do that, he had to communicate to the city what was really being planned. Now, SK, is this for you personally or is this for a bigger project? If you could... Share that in the chat or unmute yourself. We're like a small group here. Um, Cause now we're getting to the nitty gritty. Hey, I, I, know, I just know that, that that's something that you've, you've worked on and had some success with. And um, so um, th that's the, it was for the benefit of other people. Yeah. Okay, great. Got it. So, and I don't know if Peter and Christine uh, contributed at all in the effort at Lake Dallas. Um, but um, not a whole lot, but we, we came in on the tail end and I know it took um, Terry uh, two years to get approval from the city. And it, it, there, it was a big fight <laughs> to get it done. Yeah. And, it, you know, so it's not easy to make that kind of headway. Dan Fitz, like Dan Fitzpatrick, if you're if you're in the city that you want to get zoning in, Dan Fitzpatrick is an excellent resource. Um, he's, he's helped change the zoning in quite a few cities. And yeah, he, uh, he, is a, I, he has a phenomenal uh, presentation if anybody wants to uh, present to their local uh, uh, community. Yeah. And my That's suggestion, so is, oh, sorry. Okay. My suggestion is get your local tiny house enthusiast group to come out to the meetings. Yes. When, and whenever you're presenting, you got somebody presenting to the city council meetings, get the, you know, we have, we didn't know this, um, until we'd been doing this a couple of years, but in DFW, we had the biggest tiny house enthusiast group in the country, like online or whatever. It was, there's a Facebook group and the meetup group. So like combined all the membership um, and those folks came out anytime they had a meeting with like Dallas and just sat in those seats and, you know, applauded or did whatever what they were approved, you know, to do to to show their support. And that's huge. Yeah. If you can get community some community support out at the meetings to show that the show the people Want it. um the you know the city council or whoever needs to approve it that, you know, that is that you have support from the community. That's mm -hmm. that's a huge part too. So because I wear many hats, I can't stop myself. I put the link of me, uh, it's a YouTube video where interviewing Terry Lantrip. He did a whole like top 10 things you need to know. I think when, I don't know if you were there, 
um, awesome video. Really got to watch that because it really goes into like the top 10 things you need to know for developing. The other link I'm going to share in here is the Tiny Home Industry Association, which both Indigo River and myself are a member of. I know Gwen's a member of as an individual. Anyone that joins the academy becomes an automatic member as an individual per year um, because there's gold in the resource library in terms of how to be an advocate, how to do zoning changes, how to like, not so much, I would say out of all the things you can do, advocacy and everything, zoning changes are not something that we really talked a lot about. Dan knows how to do it. It's definitely something that I would say reaching out to someone like him or someone in your area that knows how to rezone because you got to know the ins and outs of like, you know, for example, there's a amazing facility there in um, Colorado being sold and only for HUD housing. But I bet they could probably do a little bit to educate that city on like, you know, I know you guys are going to allow HUD, but could you allow ANSI? Because yeah. it's not a big jump once you show the better quality that the tiny home villages, I mean, the, even the visual of where your Airbnb of the Indiegogo is sitting that is um, amazing. It had width in between the homes, beautiful homes. It looked well kept, you know. I think that's really the the flavor of what most people want in their tiny home village, right? Yeah. The, you know, have these homes look good and nice, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Peter yeah. spoke at the Dallas that. City Council meeting um, way back in the day. Uh, somebody, he and somebody else did a presentation and it's just going to take, and I just want to encourage you, Gwen, I know it probably feels like it's going to take 10 years to get it, but it really moves faster than, you know, we think it's going to just because there's so much momentum, there's so much demand. The banks are calling us. We want to lend on tiny homes that, you know, and they have to, they have to, get their board on you know their their board members on board with mm -hmm. learning on that but you know the it's the institutions that are always the slowest to change and so the people just have to lead and we have to show them that this is what we want that this is a way for people to have the american dream and own their own home and and also you know be able to move their home maybe or you know just have a smaller footprint so they're not using so much ac and you know there's a lot of reasons that people want to go tiny and you know the governments will eventually listen to us <laughs> you know if we if we are loud enough and keep at it and it's you know it's changing it's i was surprised at how quickly austin just you know and it's because of the housing crisis you know when the, any city that has any kind of a housing crisis that's the yeah. city to to go to and say we have a solution yeah yeah, and in finding the advocates, this is all embedded inside the Tiny Home. If you become a member of the Tiny Home Industry Association, there's an entire series on how to advocate. Yes. Um, the other thing that we're doing in the Thea world is doing a sponsor of jurisdiction. This is mostly builders. For example, um, you guys live in what county is the nearest to you? Like, what's the big county? Dallas. Dallas County. Dallas, okay. Dallas County, okay. So it would be like, okay, if Dallas hasn't been approved yet, we would find out, like, what? you know, activity has been happening there. And then myself and Dan and this movable tiny home briefing document gets put out. And so we've already got about five builders signing on. It's only been me promoting it, but we're going to do more and more of that because uh, there's always, regardless of what happens with HUD and companies coming out with, you know, building to state building code, there's always a benefit of building to ANSI because ANSI is the easiest. It's probably the most affordable. It requires the least amount of oversight in terms of someone actually coming out and do your on-site inspections mm -hmm. so it's still worthwhile it's just a lot of the industry has to shift and i know there's a question like long ago connected to colorado colorado is definitely something to be taking a look at um they passed this a year ago yeah. but they're writing the rules for what's to come in terms of what's allowed what kind of inspections that's their biggest one um they felt i don't know how what got under their pillow or something they had a uh, they had a meeting this week uh, on it um up there for the the legislature had a meeting on it so i I'm, i haven't heard what's what's been the outcome of it but i think the meeting happened yesterday so yeah. hopefully we'll hear some news this week about you know some progress up in the in colorado on um allowing tiny houses on wheels is tracy with building experts is she coming 
down. We haven't heard back from uh, her yet. She, I she, hope so. All right, I'll ping her again. She is right. the task force. You know, there's a reason why you guys straight. Like, oh, she's busy. No, no, no. She is literally the task force, the only builder on that task force for the state of Colorado that is holding wow. the entire tiny home industry. So the fact that the meeting happened yesterday, I'll reach back out to her and say, hey, Tracy, because she would know more than anyone what's going down in Colorado. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. when that happens, other states may follow. Because yeah. when yes. stuff happens at the state level, other states then tend to share their info. Yes. It's a like a domino. It's it's contagious, you know, it's and there's so much demand, you know, and a lot of the industries know that the demand is there. They're just trying to figure out how to, you know. Uh, modify their business model to include tiny homes. Yeah. Well, I'm super excited. I put the link of the Gather Create Tiny Home Festival, May 6th and 7th, coming right up. I yep. think Christina and I will hop on and do another Zoom call. And this one, you'll be sending out the replay to everyone. Yes, I'll put it, I'll post it on the website. Yay. Yeah. So thanks, well, thanks for inviting me. I, I am honored to be part of the Earth family. Yes. Uh, we'll celebrating you. you guys launching this festival. All right. We can't oh. wait to see you. It's just uh, two and a half weeks now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Oh, y'all get your hotel rooms because uh, today's the deadline for that. If we if we book up our rooms, then they'll extend more and, and let us have more rooms leading up to the festival. So and it's cancelable, cancelable. So if you Perfect. book your room today, then you can cancel it if, if plans change. But that they'll be more likely to let us have. And then there's camping options. There's. Um, if you bring, if you bring a tiny home and a, or a schoolie or something, you can stay in your home at the venue. Um, so we have electricity and then we, we, no water, but you have to dry dock, but, but we do have shower facilities for, um, campers at the festival. And then there are tons of RV parks that were right by Lake Levon at South Fork. So there are a bunch of RV parks yeah. where you can bring your rig and. And camp, so yeah, just stay in the town if you want to. Yeah. So, so yeah, right. cheap options, luxury hotel options. There are lots of options, and we're gonna have so much fun. We can't wait to see everybody. All right. So thanks Bye everybody. For now. Thanks for tuning in. Everyone, bye. Yeah. All right, we love you. Next time. Bye. bye.